welcome to the Recruiter Startup Podcast. Joined here today by Mark Sanofi, uh, third or fourth time on the podcast. Uh, we've uh, we've been in touch since the the start of the second half of your career. Is that fair to say? Yeah, something like that. The, the last dance, as I referred to it last last week. <laughs> Very good. All right. So, uh, just for anybody who doesn't know you, um, give us a give us your elevator pitch. Um, so very quickly, started off at S3 in the um, 90s, worked there for three and a half years, um, then was MD of a, a company called SEC that was on the uh, uh, stock market, then stayed there three and a half years, then set up Staff Group 2003, sold it in 2015 um, <clears throat> to the Corden Group, I think in what was the... Um, the largest or one of the largest UK staffing deals. Took a couple of year break, um, then um, set up Engtal um, late 2018, um, or no, late 2017 actually. Um, and um, we're a staffing company based in Chicago with a smaller office in Dallas. Um, and primarily on the perm side, uh, 41 people of which 38 full-time heads. Um, and that's kind of what, what I'm doing most of the time now, um, you know, focusing m more more on that business. Making dreams come true. Supposedly, that's the that's the prospectus. Good stuff. All right. So uh, I suppose if you're <coughs> listening to this and you're a founder, you're going to want to know how can you set up in the US and what does that blueprint look like? So we're going to delve into some of that and maybe some of the challenges. And then the other side is if you're a recruiter in the UK and let's say all in you're you're on a base of 30 to 40 and maybe you might make 20k on commission how can you go to the states and blow yeah. that number out of the water and fast track your career and what does that actually look like is it possible is it easier what's the real challenges so uh mark doesn't pull any punches you can ask anybody that so we're going to get the yeah. truth today <laughs> yeah hard truth. truth always the truth mark yeah you got all it right. all right good stuff uh, just fresh out of doing a bench session. Was it the personal best today? No, I'm going. I'm going for um, reps at the moment. So it was uh, 80 kg. Um, oh, yeah. I don't seem to be. I've seemed to have hit a wall where I'm not getting any higher than I'd like to. Um, but I give it my all. All right, good on you. Um, okay, so um, where to start? I suppose um, let's let's talk about the market in general. So the before Christmas, there was rumblings, and then it was kind of the end of the world. As somebody who runs a tech business, first thing, give us a rundown into the size and that, and maybe some of the growth trajectory of Engtal, just so people people know what we're talking about, and then jump into the market dynamics. Yeah, we, we, we're all on the direct side, direct hire side, so per permanent, um, as it would be in the, in the UK. Um, we are we're tech and engineering. Business, I, I would say fairly equally split between the two. Um, we've also got a small life sciences business, um, which we set up six, seven months ago. Um, so we are <clears throat> we're probably around six and a half million GP dollars this year. Um, and, you know, a reasonably good conversion of that to, to, to net profit. Um, and we are... Um, we, we, we had a good COVID, um, you know, first, first couple of years, trading water, pure play engineering, staffing business, um, then with social distancing, um, you know, rules in the U uh, US, we had to pivot. It was literally pivot or die. Uh, so we pivoted on to, to the tech piece, um, and that went really well. Uh, and, you know, we like, like a, a few staffing businesses had a really strong, um, COVID period, particularly last year, it was um, a real standout year, um, and been able to to build a lot of that um, this year. Twenty twenty three is going to be interesting. Um, it's you know I'm I'm speaking to more people probably at the moment to see what their view is, and I you know in the last week uh, than I have done because it's definitely um, you know it's going to be a, a journey. It's not going to be linear. It's not going to be smooth sailing for everyone but i think it's really important that you've got a fairly diverse business where you're not necessarily totally relying on one income stream um and that you are versatile enough 
to be an agile enough to to make decisions as and when you need to. Yeah, you're giving me nightmares of uh, of COVID when we got caught with one income stream doing international travel for recruiters. <laughs> it won't be that bad. It won't be that bad. Okay, will it be 2008 bad? I don't think so, no. But you, you've, you've got to prepare for that. I think you've got to be a little bit protective of cash. Mm. Um, I think, you know, when there is uncertainty, you've really got to be able to predict as well as you can do the next six months on the controllables, on, on, on your internal stuff. So I think it's those companies that may be overhired um, in, in 2022, you know, internally, probably need to um, be a little bit cautious. And what I find with the American market is at times they can be a bit reactive. They can, clients can sometimes get a little bit carried away when the time is good um, and when the time is bad, they can be a little bit reactive. I mean, we, we don't lose many people internally. I think it's probably our, our, our biggest strength. We lost a few people to, to go internal um, to, to Meta Group and um, organizations like that. And they've all been laid off, um, you know, since they took the double treble, the base. Um, <laughs> some people have got laid off quite nice, but, the, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. It's, it's just, the, I, I get why they did it. You know, you, you can you can get life changing money, work remotely, work from anywhere. It's tempting, uh, but these companies are ruthless as well. And, and when when it's not going the way they want, or they don't like what they see in the future, you will be the first to go. Talk to me more about the cost of running a recruitment business in America. Surely it's more than people think, and yeah. the cash flow element of it is more challenging. Yeah, absolutely. And if I didn't sell staff group. There is no way on earth I could have done this. Um, you, you've also, you always got to decide, do you want to go to the US from day one like I did? If you do, and if you want to bring any people in the U, from the UK to get E2 investor status, you need to have $450,000 worth of assets. May have changed, but that was certainly the case a few years ago. Mm. Um, and you need to be liquid. You also need to... Um, recognize that to hire a graduate in the US, whether it's New York, Chicago, or LA, it's gonna have a four in front of it, um, possibly with a five if it's if it's New York or LA. Um, and that costs money, you're not gonna get a return from them from a cash perspective, let's say maybe six months, five months on average, could be worse, could be better. Um, so you need, you do really need deep pockets. I, look, I think you need to be a millionaire. You know, if I if I could be as crass to say that, that's what I would say. The other way of doing it, I didn't do this, but I think you you know I know people who do is is you you do it from the UK, so you do the US from the UK. You work as near to US hours as you can do. I would suggest starting at one pm, um, finishing at ten pm. Look, you you can do it earlier, but to start yeah. with, you're going to. Need I, I think that's better. we've placed one of your top performers. Who, who've yeah. done that? Actually, yeah, he's done that. He's over. He's over now, and he, he he's a you know seven figure biller, um, and he's he's one of the best guys I've I've, I've ever ever seen. Um, and he was a two hundred k biller before, before. Yeah, he before. was. He was. But he's got a, an engine, a work ethic that is is constant. Um, mm -hmm. You know, he never. You know, and there's you have to make sacrifices on that. You know, it's the the Thursday night in the summer. Your pals are going out to, to the pub. You want to go, but you got calls. Um, it's it's really really challenging. We we were when we did it with people from the UK, and I think we had six, um, of which um, five of them have gone over to, to the US now, and they're they're all settled in there. One of them is is going to stay because he's got a child on the way, and um, you know that was always kind of the plan with him, and he's made his lifestyle work really well for him. Um, but you have to be really really disciplined um we're flexible on fridays of course and we're, we're as the as and when you know you, you get more experience you've got to show pretty much total flexibility to you know the, the individual knows what to do um but they're all over in the us now that was all kind of on their plans and it's worked out really well for them so um when you went to identify so i think like you had the ideal scenario where you're like here's a bag of money i've done this before Give us the blueprint of, of what that looked like. Yeah, I think it was, <clears throat> I've got to, I've really got to credit um, Chris Atia, who is my business partner, because he's got six years experience of there. And I, I always try to surround myself with people 
who have skills and experiences that I didn't do. I did, I did this in Germany with staff group. I got someone from the S3 group um, who I knew would have had a similar upbringing, you know, a tough, a brutal upbringing at times, you know, low base, high commission, um, that type of model. Um, and um, he knew the market really, really well. He, he had seen a lot of things that did work, that didn't work. Um, you know, the big debate, 360 V180 over in the US and both 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 techniques have their, their merit. Um, so he really helped um, kind of shape what we did. Um, and then, you know, look, it's <clears throat> a little bit trial by, by error, but do you want to go down the grad model? Do you want to go down the sales experience model cost, which costs a bit more, but they haven't maybe got recruitment? Um, and you've got to be really self-aware, I, I think, that, that when you're going over there. And um, I'll never forget, I had... We lost one person um, in the early days to rank Xerox selling photocopiers. And they told me they were going to um, that job. You know, I almost laughed thinking, you know, in the UK, that would not be, um, you know, selling printer cartridges and toner. It's not, it's not, I like to think that is not a step up from working for me, but they were earning double. They were going to earn double what they did there. Is some of these jobs that you have a value in your head. What, what, what are they earning now, I wonder? Um, I think it probably will, 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 but they've actually moved on from there, but it was about, it was about yeah. a six figure, a six figure um, salary. And you've got people working for Salesforce, you know, I, I headhunted them who are 22 year old grads taking 120, 130 K, not working that hard either. Mm. Um, so you've just got to be very aware of what you are offering and what the reality is. Uh, and I think there's a lot of spin in, in on US recruitment, you know, how much money that you, you can make. And a lot of that is definitely true, but there's also the cost of your life. You know, how much is your rent? How much is your lifestyle? All those sorts of things that, that I do think matter a lot. Yeah, so it's it's an interesting one and it's it, it's it's one I can only touch upon, but the the having taken on a few grad assignments, um, the, it was very hard to sell recruitment to them in, in the same way that you would in, Manchester or areas in England where recruitment seen as this this good thing there they they don't even think about it and you're in competition it feels with so many other industries that are paying way more yeah, yeah. how how do you identify what a good graduate is um like entering into the recruitment field when all this other competition is happening yes yeah, a good question so so I so people in the US graduate most of them graduate in May um, some a little bit, um, some at uh, different times, but most of them uh, graduate and graduate in May. I've interviewed twenty to thirty people over the last month. That you know, including last night, I've got interviews today. I've got interviews tomorrow. Um, so I am trying to cherry pick best um, graduates from the best business schools um, uh, and really who want to get into sales. That's all. That's what I really want before they get to me. So, you know, not, not so much about recruitment, but, but sales is the thing. And we've hired um, four or five people already, but people in the US, they get really early, uh, the, the, the graduates. They're really starting to look around now. And the best ones have been snapped up, uh, certainly by the time of sort of February, March time comes for a summer start next year. I did not know that at the beginning. I only realised that. Um, the, I've only realised that in the last 12, 15 months. We did that this year. None of our grads have left um, that we hired. We hired, I think, I don't know how many it was, 14 or 15 people started in the summer and um, they're all still there. Um, and I have no concerns over any of them. No, so no, Knowing a little bit about you and, and Chris, I, I know you've invested a lot in the L&D process of yeah. getting that graduate stuff right. Can, can you talk just a little bit on that? Because I think a lot of people think, I'm going to go over there, I'll put a few grads in and then it'll just all disappear. Yeah. Yeah, totally. It's, it's a good question. So, so we've again, we've learned a little bit, and it's going to get it's getting better all the time. But we've essentially got to, we do two cohorts. So we do one cohort at the start of the summer, which will be June, and then a second cohort in August for the people who maybe wanted to go traveling or to, to Europe um, in, in the summer. And then the team they almost have two teams. Um, they have their cohort team, um, and they have their team that they're going to be. Um, in, in the longer term. And I think it's worked really well where they've kind of got that, um, the people that I identify with, you know, the people who are unconsciously 
um, don't know what to do uh, because they've just started in in their 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 role. And they've also got the people who they're going to be working with, who they can see, you know, maybe who have progressed and, and what they hopefully aspire to be. And where it's worked really well for us is when they were doing the cold calling. So we don't do cold calling initially for us. It's very much candidate first and then around I don't know, week 10, week 11, they, they maybe um, evolve over to that. There is, there are nerves. Um, you know, they go into the to the room and I, I really recognise now that I just think we got this wrong a, a little bit at staff group. They go out into the room and you prepare them for them. You do all the objection handling courses, but then they can't get hold of anyone um, yeah. for a, a long period of time. So what we've done is we, we've taken a boardroom, everyone has headphones, and they're doing the cold calling at the beginning with their cohort group. And they're the celebration of the wins um, together, yeah. you know, sometimes when they get hold of someone who is just a decision maker, even though they may have been rejected. Um, has been absolutely brilliant. And the feedback has been that it just felt so good to fail um, with other people doing the same thing. And then when the, the fails turns into successes, to work really, really well. And I, I really think that's the way it should be done. But I would, if you'd asked me that 10 months ago, I wouldn't yes. have said that. That very much came from uh, the L&D team. And um, it's, it's just got rid of a little bit of those nerves that, that, that I found. And you know, we had a lot of people in, in, in previous um, lives, I saw it at S3, they get to three, four months and then they quit. Um, they just realise they haven't got the stomach for this. But if they're doing it with other people next to them, opposite them, then um, it, seems to, it seems to work better. Yeah, if you condition them early, it, it, it does. Now, just, just a question on that, because people would be listening going, how do I get the phone numbers? What am I calling? Am I calling switchboards? Am I buying the data? Like, what is that? Because in America, it's it's not easy to to get that done no. if you're not an established business. So, what does that look like from an evolution of a business who want to get into? Think, an area? You, you know, you're losing the LinkedIn maybe to get the intro and to get the details. You know, you can cross reference with Zoom info. You can cross reference with um, Seamless to, to to get all the contacts. So there's various different. Um, ways to do it and you've got to invest in your tech stack which is you know something you guys are, are, are pretty big on to avoid wasting time um yeah. to do a lot of more mundane things but it's, it's really about setting up a warm call um rather than the cold call it's just about setting up the warm call yeah. um and and you know what we teach people you've got to have the best product out there um your product has to be really really shit hot mm -hmm. um you've got to you know you can get a, a MIT alumni, two years, three years experience, or a Stanford or a Princeton, it's going to make people um, wake up. And if you can get that as, a, as your hook to, yeah. to, to get in, most of the most of the American um, decision makers, they love to talk. So they, you know, that's that's part of the battle. But there's, there's so many shit recruitment companies out there who who come up with really bad product and waste their time, and no one wants their time to be wasted. Yeah, it, it's an interesting one. I suppose that the thing you're you're trying to avoid is recruiters sitting there just doing lists for lists sake and and really actioning and getting stuff from it like do you, is that just part of your l d process that yeah that's part of the l d process putting yourself out there and you've got to be prepared to be to, to fail and to be blown out and that uh, you know what you can you achieve on a, on a call the, the biggest you know challenge i've always seen is people reluctance to make the call in the first place and to try and do everything um, over LinkedIn and you've got to get that's a mindset thing um, and you've got to get people in but I'm really I, I'm I'm really um, kind of open with people I said look let's talk about how are you going to earn $250,000 in a year that's that that's I think that's the upper end of realistic if you're really good really yeah. good being a term there the way the only way to do that is to win accounts um, and to win um, repeat business um, and to be looking at six figure accounts and hopefully getting four or five of them. I, I always remember spot. speaking to you and, and you said to me, look, the, it's all right earning a hundred grand a year or whatever, but if you want to really have a bit of life changing room in your life, then that looks at 350. And I thought, and then you broke it down. Like what? what that gets you in life compared to it and i thought ah so i, I take it that there you break that down for a 25 year old as well yeah. so like let's, yeah, let's look at what that gets you and your life has to get easier you know first first year or two proper graft um you, you're going to work really really hard you're going to make 
you know, if you're really good, you're going to make sacrifices. But everyone, they have to see their life year three, year four, year five does get a little bit easier because to make, maintain that level of intensity um, of spot business, of aggression, uh, you know, assertiveness on the, on the phone at age 30 when you've got young children or whatever, it, it, it's not sustainable. So it's all about how you, you know, what I say to people, how are you going to make your life look better? What do you want your life to look like? in 12 months, 24 months from yeah. now, let's work Let, Let's just jump back into the cost of running a business again, because mm -hmm. I, I think it's something people underestimate when they when they do the United States. And it turns out it turn, uh, there's been a lot of tears rather than a lot of joy of people who've gone there. If you look at the number of people who've tried it, it's really tough. So when you look at the landscape, there's a lot of, American firms that will call themselves search firms. Um, and in a search firm, not a, I'm not talking about uh, a, a Shrek tier one firm. I'm talking about your average firm where the guys are between, and the, girl, and the ladies are between 35 and 55 and doing their thing. And they don't really have much support. They're taking home 50% of what they bill, all of that. I see a lot of people getting their commission structure wrong because they start looking at what the competition does in America based on that. Yeah. How how do you build a commission structure that keeps your cash flow in intact, but yet rewards what the people do in a sensible way? And like, can you can you elaborate on what your journey was on that? Yeah, I think. I think that's really interesting. So look, at the start, if you go down the grad model, um, then you can do it, uh, as, I don't know, 40 to 50,000 base um, with a tiered commission structure um, with, with an attractive top end. Um, I think it, it, it where it, you, you really just, it's all about identity. It's all about just work, working out who do you want to be um, and where, where do you want to get to. If you are... If you are doing it and you're looking to hire experienced people in the US, based in the US who are American citizens, it's going to cost you a lot of money. There's just no two ways about it. I interview people, not you know, pretty regularly, um, who probably will want 200,000 in, in the form of a draw, in the form of a guarantee with a base maybe. Um, 100, 120, you know, some, something like that. It's a lot of money. Wow. Um, you know, and I, I think if you want to set up in the US properly, you need to be looking three quarters of a million dollars. You know, that, that's my honest opinion to do it properly. It gives you a little bit of slack if you fail. If you've got a UK business or a German business that is spitting out that level of money, then that's great. When I say to, when I speak to um, people asking me for advice, which I do reasonably regularly, I say, OK, fine. That is going to have an impact on your dividends, on how much money you are going to draw down um are you okay with that it also might go wrong mm. and it also means are you how much time are you personally prepared to be in the us and are your family friends cool with that mm. my view is that you do need to be based over there or one of the owners of that business needs to be based over there and they need to live breathe and sleep the lifestyle of, of doing it over there i think if you're doing it from the UK um, and you're servicing it from the UK I haven't seen many of those do it well and do it successfully um, because I think eventually it's quite it's hard to scale up um, you know I, I was unable to get 10 people from the UK doing the US mm. who were similar sets of standards and I, re I did really try um, so I think you've got to go out there I'm not really bothered now personally looking for people who want to stay in the UK forever and do the US. I'd let them do it for three to six months, but it's no life. Yeah. It is, it, you know, I can't, I can't expect people to do calls at one, one AM in the morning. Um, and then you can't, cause you can't go to sleep after that. You know, you're, you're absolutely wired. I've spoken to a couple of people who, who were taking sleeping pills to help them do that. I'm like, fuck me you're in your 20s do you really want to be doing this sort of stuff it's not it's not right yeah. so you've got to go out there in, in my opinion um or to work for me anyway um within the first six months and you've got to embrace it yeah so for anybody who's <clears throat> earlier in their journey and wondering what a tiered commission structure the easiest way i would explain it is the first third covers business costs the second third 
is split between you and the boss. The third, 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 the third bit is when you're yeah, a top yeah. performer and you're getting the lion's share of that. And the aim is the first bit keeps your job just about because we need people who want more than that. The second bit, you're in the mid tier of the room. It's valuable. It's grand. The third, the third tier, we're bringing in a trophy for you every day. You're writing your own checks. Is that fair to say? Yeah, uh, you, you, you're bang on. You've got to see cost in the US. You know, if you're if you're if you're based in the US, your seat cost, I would imagine, would be something between ten to fifteen thousand dollars a month, depending on um, what you get with your your firm, where your office is based, where you know if, it, if it's New York, LA, it'll be probably slightly higher than, than Chicago. Um, we're we're pretty punchy on if they do thirty thousand dollars and above. If they do thirty thousand dollars and above, they get. Uh, 24% of the whole lot, um, no no threshold. And our business is set up where our average fee for one placement is north of 30,000. So so really what I'm saying to, to, to them is you do one deal, one placement, 360, yeah. um, you'll, get, you'll, you'll get the big whack. And that's the dream. Um, so I'm deliberately trying to create a environment with high reward but but also high risk because you know that deal drops out my god you know it's, it's a lot of money for the company to lose but it's a lot more for, for the individual to you to, to lose and there's various different takes on the commission structure um when it when it gets out there um but it's what you it's what you're going to get yeah, i suppose <coughs> a little bit in return for for that but there's a seat cost and if you come in and you've got a really high base there's going to be a red dot on you, I, I think. And I see that happen. You know, a lot of people um, in US firms, and some of these US firms are ruthless. They will they will cut you if, they do not, if they're not making their money. Um, what's the headcount at right now? Um, 41. Uh, 38 of them are full-time. Three of them, you know, back office uh, people at the moment. Um, we've hired, as I said earlier, in the call, we've hired a few people um, to start next summer, about five in addition to that. Are you in consolidation mode or are you in a, in a growth mode to get to the next uh, headcount target? I think I need what we need at the moment is probably a couple of senior people because we've recruited a lot of people in um, in the summer. So we're, we're, we're definitely bottom heavy um, experience wise. So I, I mean, you know, I've got discussions with a couple of senior people, with, which I, I hope will, will yield some fruit and that will then allow me to kind of go um, a, a, again, but with one eye on the market. You know, the market at the moment is you've got, you've got to make sure you know your costs. You know, what is your break even point every single month? We have very few contractors. Um, we, we have some, but not many. Um, and you, you've got to then look at your recurring revenue. Is, are you good at selling retainers? You know, is there a core level that you're selling yeah. retained at, at the moment? And then what is your floor? Then this is what I always say to, to all my sales manager. What is your floor? What does your good look like? What is your bad look like? Mm. um don't give me don't give me these headlines you know you're going to be doing x y and z you know you've got to realize when you're bad how bad are you mm. um and then i do that with all the managers and then chris and i will kind of work that out and we'll have a level of um that we're fairly comfortable at as our floor and um we'll make sure we don't try and hit below that floor of, of the 12 months of the year and if somebody's in the uk listening to this and dreaming of a move abroad or considering it what does their profile and track record need to look at look like for you to go, do you know what? You're worth it to either come straight out or to start in the UK and then come out. Walk me through that a little bit. Yeah. So I, I, I think, look, if you want to get an E2 visa, um, you need three years experience. If you anyone tells you otherwise, they are lying to you. Okay, so you need a minimum of three years experience. If you've got less than three years experience, then you ain't going to get a visa. And there's consequences of that, you know, because then you won't be allowed into the US. It's just a risk I would not advise anyone to take. So they've got to have three years of recruitment experience. This is not, not sales experience. They, For me, they would need to have built a minimum in the UK market of 150, 160,000 sterling with over 50% of that and ideally 75% of that on a BD um, level of success. Mm. Um, I think this is for their benefit as well, because if they can't prove that they can do BD to themselves, um, then they will struggle, um, I, I think, out there. So that's what they've got to look at. Um, and then, um, you know, has it come from blue collar? Has it come from white collar? I think that we're probably looking for people who've had success in the STEM marketplaces. Um, 
And then that will translate pretty well whether you're doing life sciences, whether you're doing tech, whether you're doing engineering. Um, and you've then got to be prepared to, I think, leave within, move from the UK within three to six months. For, nearer to three is it, it, better. That's how long I think the visa process would, would start. You're going to need to start at the American firm, I think, before you start the visa process, um, because I think otherwise it, it it's not cut and dry that you'll get the you'll get the E two, and then and then yeah, then you've just got to choose where you want to live in America, uh, and you've got to do your due diligence on this. You know, you've got to work out. There's five low. You know, four, we're in Chicago. Okay, we're probably. I, you know, there's a there's a league table of, of, of where people want to go. It's New York, it's LA, and you've now got Austin, you've now got Florida. Um, I, I would probably be honest enough to say Chicago is probably fifth on that list when you when you first speak to them. Uh, and then you've got to, the, the individual has got to say, right, if it, if it is LA, what is it about LA that I'm really um, interested in? If it's New York, what, am I, what is it that I'm really interested in? And what are the costs of living in these cities? Um, because yeah, you, you might build be able to uh, to have a, you know a great life in LA, but I was in LA, I was Santa Monica and West Hollywood over the summer, and I'm being charged fifteen dollars for a, a Moretti beer, um, and then you've got a tip on top of that. Of, you know, it's it's not it's not. And you're cheap, stepping though. over a homeless person on the way to it. Like you're if- stepping over a homeless person. New York, you know, New York is New York is great. Look, I, I I I love New York, but it's it's CNN just voted it as the most expensive city in, in the world with um, Singapore this year. Um, there's a reason for that. I've got really close friends earning two hundred and ten thousand two dollars a year, and it, it isn't an easy lifestyle there. Um, and you've got to really be honest about that. And what frustrates me a little bit with some of the <clears throat> um, people, you know, boasting about the the level of earnings, the level of fees in the US. Yeah, sure, that's really great, but. You know, if you're going there to, what is the norm? What do people in your firm actually really earn? You know, who have been there, done done it a bit. What is your, what is your standard level of performance? And if you're earning a hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year, good. Um, which I'd suggest is probably the case. That doesn't go very far in in New York versus, say, Chicago. Um, and that's why I think Chicago. I, I really believe in this city. Dallas as well, you know, it, it, Dallas obviously no income tax, you've got the same benefits of Austin. If you tried to, I was in Austin uh, this year, it's a great place. You try and find an apartment there. Yeah. The population is growing so fast, there isn't the accommodation there to, 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 to house them and then you're paying really, really high costs. You want to be paying three and a half thousand dollars a month for rent. I mean, that's a lot of money. Yeah. Well, I think that's uh, quite a robust answer, um, both for founders who are thinking of setting up and for recruiters who are potentially looking to get there. Um, any other last thoughts on, uh, on, on for anybody who is thinking about the US and like any preparation that they should do? Um, I think you've got to look at the tax um, rates in each of the different region, regions. And you've got to just, you've really got to look at what your spend is going to be. If you're going to be doing, I, I would look at a one bedroom um, flat cost on your own because even if you do a flat share um uh, initially then you might aspire to a one bedroom flat um uh, eventually and i would work out whether it is what you you think it is um i would look at the price of a coffee a beer a steak you know the sort of things that that you you, yeah. you maybe think give you a good lifestyle and just think um, is it worth it? I think I would look at the expats' success um, from moving over. We, we've been really, really successful. I think the guy we spoke about earlier, I mean, he built over a million uh, last year. Our top builder this year is is, is an expat. Uh, I think we've managed to get five of our top six have been UK expats this year. Um, I, I think that will be the case next year. I think it will be the, the grad content uh, mm-hmm. contingent will, will, will do that, but you do need to look at that and the support structure. Yeah. You know, what are, what are you going to be doing on a Sunday? Um, you know, uh, Sunday when your, your family are at home um, can be, be really tough. Um, what do you want your life to look like on a Sunday? You know, it's, it's those sorts of periods of time. Sunday in February in Chicago or in New York when it's minus 15, yeah. you know, you're not going to be wanting to go, you can go out to the cinema. It's the, yeah. you know, the journey there is so cold. So you've really just got to be fairly honest about that. But but the opportunity um, 
is is incredible. And we had so one of our grads started in the summer, did a fifty five thousand deal, um, and you know making you know near enough fifteen thousand commission for, for from that from that placement. So it's it's really it's really exciting. I I, I posted the other week, and I, I really stand by this that you know a Premiership footballer, you know, or a good footballer, generally speaking, now will come to the Premiership because of the, the the opportunity, because of the potential, a good recruiter, they have to consider the US if their personal circumstances allows, because because it's it's truly an un- unbelievable lifestyle. Yeah, and if I could reflect on on it from our own our own circumstance, um, I, I've I've worked in Australia and Canada and that, and I think if we had have got into recruitment maybe a little earlier, or went to America instead of Canada after Australia, we'd, we'd be in America now. And when I did the sums to, when Charlotte did the sums, to uh, to work out like where we're going to go after COVID. And we looked at like, what, yeah. is our, what does our ideal life look like? Like how much is it going to cost for schooling? How much does it cost for, uh, how much is it going to cost for rent? Like we like to have personal trainers, private Brazilian jiu-jitsu classes, like to eat out a lot, like to not work all the time, like to pay low taxes. We ended up here, but that probably comes to my point that there's a window in life to make these type of calls and to make this happen. And if you don't go for it at the right point, you have to go for another thing. And I'm happy here, but it's a plan B. So it's there's a finite time that you can do, isn't that right? Yeah, it's your, it's your risk appetite. Um, and I think that risk appetite pre- before children, um, risk appetite before you've met your partner, risk appetite post over there. And I think you're, you're, you're bang on. I, I think it's, it, raising a kid in New York or someone like that, I mean, I, I, I'm astonished at how much it costs. I am, you know, if you want childcare and it's preschool, um, I am astonished by how much it costs. I, I don't know how people afford it. I don't know either. Um, uh, but if you're if you're 23, 24, and you've got only yourself to look after, then um, yeah. yeah, I get it. You know, I, yeah. I, I, I totally get it. I think people underestimate that. You know, they think they're going to be young forever, and they think like they're like, oh, I'll, I'll wait until like I get this call all the time. I want to go to America, but I want to wait until I'm a senior manager. I'm like, it's going to be too late. You like the their appetite to pay you senior management wage won't be there. You're you'll have to be married. You're probably not married. You, you've got kids. You're going to be looking at private school because it's going to be like the, everything right now is your time. Like you can do this now. And for founders who are thinking of doing it as well, if you're going to move yourself over there, like earlier the better. Because if you're having to do that with a family, it is so expensive. It's so yeah. hard. It can be done. Like I, I've I've moved people across, but it's it's hard. It's 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 really hard. It's really hard, and it's just got to be whether it's worth it. It may be better to uh, build two hundred thousand a year in Manchester and have a, a a life that is reflective of 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 that cost. But I, so, I suppose it's also really important to dream. Yeah. I, I I mean I. Some of the other, the lesser well-known U.S. cities, the Denver's of this world, the Philadelphia's of this world, I think there's great opportunity there. You know, we've got no, I've got no dog in the fight with those places, but it's, it, I, I believe in them. I just don't believe in the really expensive U.S. cities as much now. That, I, I, I suppose to finish on a, on, on a, on a good note with, with risk versus reward, if you were to look at your business partner's journey from Portsmouth to... Yeah making that move to America. Like what does his life look like having it, having worked out doing all those steps? He, he, he's had a, he's had a wonderful journey. And I think where, you know, the, the heart of our relationship is friendship. You know, we, we become really quite tight with each other and, and prepared to, you know, very comfortable disagree with each other and, and so forth. But his life is, is great. I mean, he's the CEO, he runs this business, you know, makes the decisions on a day-to-day basis. You know, we consult, and speak fairly regularly, but um, I defer to him um, on, on virtually um, everything. He has been able to buy um, a 
a huge place um, in Chicago with a roof terrace that is bigger than flats with a TV screen and, you know, grill areas and all that sort of thing. He's, mm. you know, married and, and settled down. And um, his his life has, you know, completely changed. And, we, we, you know, he's built some initiatives to really help um, those less fortunate. You know, we've set up a charity over there to where we give, one thousand um, uh, dollars of our fee to to anyone who's from a diverse background, and you know we've we only did that uh, very recently, and it, it's raised you know enough now to start schooling and to making a real impact. So, so there's a little bit more you know than trying to be in a, a you know just a, a typical recruitment company, and I think what's really worked well for him is we are a US company. We are, we are, I have no aspirations to do the UK to do the, to do Europe. If we pull vacancies in those areas, I just would say right you know we can't help you there this is people in my network i'll get no money from it i don't want any money from it and you know it's for them to do their best to, to do it and i think that's helped him just be able to focus solely on the us um and to do what works for his his business um o- over there and it's been it's been a real eye-opener i think last week he had what i thought was the most crazy idea to, to to take out all the parents of the staff of, of of our people in chicago i thought oh my god you are a cliched wanker this is this is this, <laughs> this is just so not me do not tag me on it. that's so I'm far gonna, from I, you that i am so, i am gonna get so much banter and it was the best <laughs> thing i was there and it was the best thing ever because it's so important you know parents but, are so eyes in loyalty as well it buys in loyalty and it's so amazing to see the parents of some of your staff and just think wow you know because you get to know the staff really well and it's just like wow you know this is part of the reason maybe for you know the way you are and stuff like that and they're just so proud of their children they just want to you know they want to see out their children's life and I know with my parents they, they didn't know what I did you know those days at S3 my god I'd come back on a Saturday with Saturday morning from wherever I'd been I'm like she's got the shakes and stuff like that what the fuck are you doing Mark over there um whereas you know here it's just really great to to, to meet you know, people in the love ones, but that was his idea. That was nothing to do with me. Yeah. And um, it's it's just so I'm learning so much. You know, yeah. it's it's great. All right, Mike. That's us today. Thank you so much. Lovely, lovely to talk to you.